You're listening to Through Help and Back. Through Help and Back is a podcast focused on mental health, addiction, treatment, recovery, and all things related to personal improvement and wellness. Don't worry, we're not here to talk about problems without solutions, and we're definitely not here to talk about struggles without success. So come with your problems, leave with our solutions. Thanks again, Caroline, for being here. I um, want to make that point really, really clear. It's funny, living in the Northeast and, and knowing your background, Ian, you were saying it wrong this whole time. We, it is like sweet mm. Caroline, okay? So we're not going to get that. We're not going to get those wires crossed. It is, uh, it is not a Caroline, but it is a Caroline. And uh, we're very happy and thankful that you're here. So, oh, I'm so really looking forward to this conversation today. That's good. That's good. Me too. I got a lot to learn from you. I was looking into a little bit of your background and some of your stuff online and uh, some interesting perspectives that I definitely want to get into and make time for. Um, for everybody in this field, I think we kind of take the approach of being a lifelong learner. And even though our our paths have kind of crossed in terms of subject matter, uh, different times and different approaches. So I'm excited to, to learn what you uh, what you bring to the table and what your perspectives are. Um, before we get too far down the road, I always like to ask people kind of right off the bat, especially with helpers, you know, therapists and the like, I'm always interested in kind of the origin story about, you know, what got you into this field, what, what drew you to helping people, what attracted you uh, to doing this with your life. So tell me a little bit about your, your background and, and what led you to become a helper. I love that question. Well, first off, I hear origin story. For some reason, my mind goes to like Batman or, you know, like Christopher Nolan's Batman, like when he's in the cave and the bats and all of that. Um, yeah. So my origin story, you know, I guess it's not too dissimilar in a way. I mean, like so many of us in the helping professions, you know, my uh, life today was really informed by some of the struggles and challenges that I had as a young person, you know, and I grew up, I had a lot of, as many of us do, you know, adverse childhood experiences, divorce, you know, growing up in a household where there was substance use and fast forward some time as a woman and a young woman, I started to experience things around uh, sexual abuse and trauma and some of those heavier things that led me to really early on some pretty dark places, you know, and some pretty hard places. And I think that part of, you know, the great thing that I've learned through some of those challenges, uh, like Batman in the cave, you know, with all the bats and the scary things, is that, you know, we can use those experiences and those hard things can be redeemed and we can have some of those hard things help us understand the folks that we're connecting with today. And it's really inspired me, I think, coming from a place of tremendous trauma and hurt and struggle. It's inspired me to help other folks who are out there hurting today, you know, and we were kind of joking a little bit before things are, things feel different today. Substance use challenges, mental health challenges, everything on the rise, everything amplified there's an urgency to be out there helping and to doing the work. And so a little bit of my background there, um, don't want to get into too much of the nitty gritty because we can get stuck there. I like to focus and stay in a recovery place. I appreciate you sharing what you did. And and one thing I want to kind of like connect with you on right off the bat is that sense of urgency. You know, it's funny when you work in addictions uh, and, and I think even just as citizens of the world, you know, we see news stories about X amount of people are, you know, abusing drugs at this point or dual diagnosis rates have climbed to this or, you know, over 100,000 drug related deaths last year. And I think the risk in that is we've almost kind of uh, kind of lost the shock value in those headlines a little bit where people just go like, well, we know this is going on and it's kind of just part of what's going on and it, it, it sucks and that's terrible. But, you know, That's how it is nowadays. And I just, you almost want to kind of jump up on the table and be like, no, it doesn't have to be that way. It's not just how it is. Like things have changed at a rapid pace. And those are 100,000 individuals, 100,000 families, 100,000 plus children that are affected. You know, sort of why do we, you know, accept that as just sort of a given and sort of a normal part of day to day? Like where is that sense of urgency as a nation, as a people to to fix that issue, you know? Um, I don't know. That, at least that's my perspective. Have you kind of felt that in your own work that people just sort of like accept it as how it's going to be? Or are you seeing kind of different different takes on that? You know, I think I'm seeing both. So I agree 100% that almost desensitization to what's going on with the crisis and the 
opioid epidemic and the overdose fatalities and some of those, like you said, statistics that we see feels like all the time of all this bad stuff around substance use and mental health challenges. And at the same time, I think when we are personally impacted and personally have felt what that pain feels like of losing someone or watching a loved one struggling. When we're personally impacted, it is like we are on fire for that cause. So while I think so many people are desensitized, as soon as that touches your own life story, the folks that I know who've been impacted, I'm raising my hand here, We are like all in for how can we be a part of the solution and helping people today? Because like you said, it doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to just turn on the news or scroll on our phones and see these sad statistics. There are things that we can do today to help others. I know we're not getting into specific details, but I am curious about sort of timeline. Uh, Because one thing I will note is, and it's so funny, this is as therapists, we sort of know this. Everybody has their own individual story, and you have to worry about bias. And so one thing I love about your story, Caroline, is to look at you and to listen to you and to look at your credentials and to look at your work and to look what you're doing with your life now. I don't think anybody would guess what you've been through. You know what I mean? And so, one, that's a compliment to your progress. And two, part of the reason we started this podcast is, is sort of to reveal to people that People in the helping professions are human. We've had our, our bad experiences. We've had our tough days. I mean, I struggled with an anxiety disorder for a long time. There is trauma in a lot of our lives. And so we take that humanity and we carry it forward and we use it as fuel and we use it as a resource to help other people. But it's still your individual lived experience. So one, compliments to your progress because I don't think anybody would ever would ever guess. You know what I mean? And that's that's amazing and it's interesting at the same time. But I, I am curious going back without too much detail – um, you know, how old were you when you sort of realized, hey, there are there are issues in, in my world, there are issues in my my family. And then how did that evolve into getting help yourself, maybe, or transitioning to a place where you could use that to help others? I'm curious, you know, how when that started and how long that took? I'd like to say that it took less time than it did. But I think I knew that uh, I knew that I had a problem when, you know, it was the first drink. You know, for me, it was nicotine, you know, out in the woods, sneaking cigarettes back before vaping. That was going to age me. Right. But we were still smoking old fashioned cigarettes back then. Um, But it didn't matter what the substance, whether it was nicotine or alcohol, you know, very quickly cannabis and then harder substances, pretty much anything, you know, that I could do to escape what I was feeling. I knew right away that I had a problem. You know, I remember taking a, a first drink at 11 and thinking to myself, I might be an alcoholic and the understanding that it was almost subconsciously. I knew that I had a problem with substances. You know, I couldn't define it. I couldn't, you know, certainly didn't go to school at that time to understand more about it other than the dare program, you know, but I knew right away that there was something in me, whether it was genetic or environmental or because of some of the trauma that I experienced or all three, there was something in me that led me to seek out, feeling better, seek out escape through, through substance use. And so, you know, 11 to high school, and that's really when things took off for me, you know, mentioned harder drugs. I mean, and especially as a woman in active addiction, that spiral happened so fast. And I was just in so many really vulnerable places taken advantage of and just very traumatized, multiple instances of sexual assault, you know, just, And those experiences, it was like this shame that just kept growing inside of me. So the more bad things that happened because of my substance use, the more I wanted to use substances to kind of self-medicate, you know, what was happening. So it wasn't until later high school, I I experienced an overdose. And um, thankfully, I have an involved family and they helped me find addiction treatment. And I went to inpatient treatment for a short time. And so at 17, you know, I was all in on the recovery journey. I was like, I am doing this. Uh, I want to change my life. You know, I thought I had the answers after a short stay in treatment. You know, my family thought I was cured, right? We just, I, everyone had all this hope for me. And I came back to the same environment without recovery support services, without a lot of the things that I needed. And it took another decade 
of drinking, drug use, sexual violence, all of the stuff that is wrapped up for me in my active addiction, mental health challenges. Uh, you know, you talk about anxiety. That's a huge part of my story too. And so it wasn't until I was 28 where I connected finally with peer recovery support and other types of therapy specifically for my trauma. And I was able to, you know, I've been able to sustain and maintain a recovery lifestyle. And I'm so grateful for that. It's amazing. So two questions come to mind you, and I'll ask them sort of in order. So the first one is, and I think people who love addicts, right, or love people that are struggling with addiction, they, they ask themselves this kind of question over and over, which is, you know, how can you identify this problem, know you have a problem, you even had a period of sobriety, right, because you went to treatment and then get back out. Knowing all that and having that education and knowing that it's not good for you, like how could you keep doing it? You know what I mean? And I know that's an overly simplistic question, and I know there's a lot of layers to that. But I think that that's something that loved ones always ask, you know, and we've had uh, addiction in our family. I've been at the table when we're talking about the addict, and that's always the question that comes up. Like, they know this isn't good for them. Damn it. Why do they keep doing this? Why do they keep falling back into this? So I'm curious about your perspective on that, both from a personal and a professional perspective. And then to give it kind of like a positive outcome, I'm curious about what was different when you didn't go back. What was the difference that made the difference that allowed you to kind of finally uh, achieve stability? I don't want to say escape because it's always part of the story and it's always a risk, but you know, what was it that was different that allowed you to finally achieve stability in the progress that you wanted? Well, first off, thank you. Know, thank you. I love these conversations because it's not just about someone, you know, me being interviewed, but I love how we can have dialogue and connect over our shared experience. And it sounds like, you know, you've had a loved one in this situation. I mean, every family nowadays, right? It's like, it's either, it's either, it's either in your family or somebody, you know, right. Or I tell people, or it will be, you know, not to freak you out, but um, it will be. There's, you know, this idea that someone who is struggling with addiction has a choice. And I think that concept of choice or, you know, willpower is kind of so tied into a misunderstanding about addiction as a medical condition, addiction as something that impacts the brain in terms of how our, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist, but how our neural pathways are hardwired and how we develop habits and patterns. And so how difficult that is without successful and repeated intervention, how difficult that is to break the cycle. And, you know, I'm a perfect example of that. And I was the person my family was sitting around talking about. And the more that I disappointed them when I felt like, oh, why, you know, and I felt the same way. Why am I continuing to do what I don't want to do? You know, why am I continuing to do this? And I had so much shame and guilt wrapped up in my substance use disorder and my family, you know, they weren't purposefully trying to, you know, add more challenge to my journey, but I think they're not understanding that I wasn't choosing this life. I wanted to get out of it too. And so today I think what's really, I want to say exciting about the research that that's out there now and about the different types of treatment and recovery support services that we have we know now that it's more than choosing and we know now what actually will help an individual. And that is, you know, I'm like a broken record, continued and sustained interventions, whether that's continued treatment, recovery support services. I'm a huge fan of recovery housing and outpatient ongoing supports and treatment. And, you know, you asked for me what finally interrupted that pattern of in and out. And, and I mean, it was over a decade. What finally changed things, I believe for me was I started going to an outpatient treatment center and the outpatient treatment center had a peer-based group and it was age specific. And it was for young people at the, I'm in my forties now. I don't consider myself a young person. I'm like a middle-aged recovery person, but back when I was a young person in recovery, I was able to attend groups with other people like me that were my same age. I was able to start doing things like activities and fun things sober. I had no idea you could have fun in sobriety. And I had ongoing peer support and people who believed in me and were able to speak 
hope into my life. It wasn't that, oh, there's Caroline, you know, oh, she's, you know, I doubt she's going to be sober this time. And here's what she's done. And here's her long list of wrongs. But I had people look at me and say, you, there's possibility and potential for your life. You know, you can be a leader in this space. We have hope for you. Recovery is possible. And the more I heard that, I started to believe it. And I believe that really changed my life. We haven't even gotten into the big like aha moments, but you're so passionate about this that it's it's very inspiring just sitting here like, you know, I've I've been working in this field for 20 years and I used to be a young guy in this field and now I'm a middle aged guy in this field, too. So I, I join you in that. But um the blood gets moving, right? Like I I feel it like there's energy and there's just real heart and authenticity and passion and urgency. And just, um, I don't know. I don't even have a question. I just want to note that like, you can tell that you're the phrase is on fire for recovery, not only your own, but for other people. And, um, I don't know. I just commend you for that. Cause like I said, I think one of the traps that's out there is people just sort of accept it and, Oh, well, you know, she's relapsed again, this is the eighth time, if not the ninth time, if not the 20th time, it's always going to be like this. And um, I just think that you're a nice living example of like, no, no, it can change, but you have to be consistent. You have to intervene over time and you have to be passionate about it. I think that authenticity, you know, I can be a leader in the space because so much of this I feel is, is tied up in identity, right? Eventually drugs and alcohol is not what you do. It's part of who you are, right? That addict cycle. And once you accept that as this is part of who I am, I mean, you know, you're going to find a way to prove yourself right, even if it means you got to do wrong, right? To prove yourself right. And if you think that you're a a mess up or a loser or an addict or a junkie or not going to be worth anything, like you will find ways to prove that right. And it sounds like you found a way to connect to a different version of yourself, a different identity, a more aspirational version of self and said, no, no, I'm going to I'm going to push towards this version of me. And, and here we are years later, you can tell you're really feeling it and really like so passionate about this. And I don't know. I just think that's amazing for your clients because I bet they feel it too. Interestingly, I had someone say that. So I spoke at a church youth group a couple nights ago and it was a group of students who are, you know, in high school and really facing some incredible challenges today around substance use. And we're talking about, you know, you can't even go into a bathroom in a high school without being confronted with substances. And I mean, it just, it's so challenging, but someone mentioned the passion and what I think is so beautiful about being in recovery today is that I am not unique in that passion. You have it. Every person that I've met out there who's been able to sustain recovery for any amount of time, they have it. You know, there is a passion, there is a hustle, there is a desire to walk out purpose because we've seen the other side and we don't want to go back. But more importantly, it's about other people now and it's about helping other people. And, um, and like we've talked about just the urgency, you know, I mean, I looked at these kids sitting in this room and just, you know, my mind wanted to start feeling like, Oh, they're, you know, it's going to be hard and it's going to be. And yes, while that's true, I need to keep focused on having hope too you know, having hope. And that's what I would say to family members who are struggling today with, you know, is my loved one ever going to get it? You know, how, you know, how can they keep doing this to us? And, you know, if you're struggling with a loved one's substance use disorder, what I would say is don't give up hope. It doesn't matter if it's the eighth time or the 18th time. If your loved one is still here, we need to have hope for that person. And I I just encourage family members to continue to have hope that recovery can happen. Because if you would have seen me at 17 years old, there is no way you would have said, this is where I would be in this moment today talking to you. Well, and that's what we ask. That's what we ask the individual addict to do. We ask them to believe in a version of themselves that they either haven't experienced in a very, very long time and may have forgotten, or they may have never experienced, right? We're wanting them to invest in a version of themselves that is capable and is strong and is safe and is powerful and optimistic and hopeful. And, you know, they're like, I've been, I've been on a run for 20 years. I don't even know who you're talking about. That doesn't even seem realistic for me, but we're asking them to invest into that version of themselves. Certainly the people who are adjacent to that, who are loving that person, you know, they can help lead the way and they can help make that same investment, you know. And I know that there are millions of families who wish 
that they still had the opportunity to make an investment, even in the face of all evidence, right? Because they've, they've lost people. I mean, that's the harsh reality of this is that it's a terminal condition if, if left untreated, you know? So, um, I know you're passionate about women's issues and I want to talk about that very soon, but I, you've talked about young people and you were a young person in recovery. You're helping young people in recovery. Uh, you gave a little message to parents or people who are loving, uh, you know, young people in recovery, but as a parent myself, um, do you have any insight to share to, you know, either A, how to be protective of kids and how to shield them from this, um, or even B, if you do have concerns, how to react in the most you know, positive and productive way uh, to help, you know, get our children to a safe place, you know, once there's an issue? Yeah, well, and, you know, I have kids too. I have five-year-old twins. So I am, you know, I am, they're going to be coming down the, the way here, going to high school at some point. Uh, you look incredibly well rested to have five year old twins, the but you know, good for you. <laughs> it's the lighting, trust me. <laughs> Filters and yeah. lighting. Filters oh, and lighting. lighting. Yeah, Love yeah. you. Um, the youth that I spoke with a couple of nights ago, I think had the answer to what you're asking. And, you know, I flat out asked them, like, hey, what is going on today in your world that's causing you and causing the folks that you know, the kids that you know, to go towards using substances? And the number one thing that this room of kids said was stress. It's a way to cope with stress. And that was so interesting to me because I connected with that. My use was how to cope with some of the stress of what I've lived and some of the untreated trauma symptoms I didn't know I had, you know, but it, it really was when you boil it down a coping strategy. So I think when we're looking at how to help and support the youth today, whether they're struggling right now with addiction or maybe just, you know, moving into experimentation or whatever phase they are in the process is how can we help youth identify healthy coping strategies for the stressors that they're facing? And um, yeah, that would be, you know, something that I would definitely tell parents to is how do we help kids identify ways to cope? You know, whether that's starting counseling early, you know, you don't have to, and I'm a huge proponent of therapy. You don't have to wait until like that major massive thing happens to start seeing a counselor. You can do that before and help build up healthy coping strategies and healthy ways of being in the world. And I will encourage my kids at some point to definitely, you know, reach out for additional support because we all can use support. I love talking to a therapist myself. You know, I think it doesn't matter what stage we are in the recovery process. We can all gain support um, from talking with someone and, and, you know, accessing treatment. And for parents, too, I think it's so important that we just show up and listen, you know, just show up and listen. You know, I told my story with this group of kids, but the most impactful thing wasn't me talking it wasn't me sharing all this stuff I knew or all the dangers of drug use, you know, and fentanyl, but it was listening to what they had to say. What are their concerns? Why are they thinking about using drugs and alcohol? You know, what's going on in their world that this is a part of it today? So I think listening is also another huge thing that we need to just show up for our kids and do. Two huge points that I think you make there, and I agree with you 100%, is one, that it's not always about the drugs themselves, but what the drugs are being used for, right? So, you know, when you talk about stress or other issues, um, you know, why, you know, people ask that, why, why would people use drugs? Well, part of it is because they work. For a very long time, they work. If you want to feel better, you can feel better. If you want to feel less bad, you can feel less bad. Uh, they're really effective, you know. And so that's part of the thing is that they're rewarding and reinforcing. And so to ask that deeper question as a parent and to not sort of freak out about the drug issue so much, but to push back to why did you have that desire to feel differently in the first place? Because now we're talking about core issues, right? And it could be trauma. It could be dramatic things. It could be I was hurt and I was abused and, you know, PTSD type stuff. But it could also just be stress and it could be fear and anxiety and, and you know, an uncertain future. And um, so suspending judgment, not moralizing and just going like really wanting to know why. Not in that terms of like, why? How could you do this? But like, no, why? How, how did this work for you at first? And why did you have that initial urge? I think it's so key to understanding the core issues that are going on. And the second piece that you bring up when you talk about stress and kids that I think people need to understand is it is really hard to be a kid nowadays. I mean, it is, I think it's, in, in some ways, it's, it's a really cool time to be a kid with your access to information and 
you know, the technological advances and things like that. But I think in some ways it's, it's the worst time. Um, and I know kids used to work in mines and things like that. I mean, obviously that was like physically worse, but you know, I mean the bullying and you know, I mean, just the 24 hour relentless and the constant comparing to perfect people on social media and the, the speed and the volume of all the information. And then you throw in the expectations and just, I just think it's really, really hard to be a kid right now. And, um, you know, I think parents understanding that, appreciating that, and helping equip our children for the world they actually live in, not the one that we wish they lived in, is, is a really important part of this in terms of being protective. So, um, yeah, I, I appreciate that perspective. And I, I appreciate you taking the time to listen to those kids because that really is a hard thing. When a kid's talking to an adult, they don't really get a non judgmental listener very often. It's, it's a teacher or it's a coach or it's a parent and all those people have things they want the kid to do or things they want the kid to be, uh, to really actually be receptive to what you're hearing and just hear them out, um, is, is a real gift. So, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I'm just kind of wandering through a thought there, but Ian, you're, you're closer to being kid. Did it, does it suck being young nowadays or is it okay? Ian's very young. He's like, well, how old are you now? I'm 21. 21. Not so that young. yeah, so he's a he's a baby. So you were a kid not too long ago. I was. So I was. you've had a computer your whole life. You've had a phone your whole life. I did. I mean, like um I really like the idea of stress and escaping stress really resonates with me. Mm. Um cuz also with my situation, I did grow up in a different country and to mm. be in a new country that really adds to the need to deal with the stress or or to just feel something different. Um but not to go into too much details, you know, my way of escaping was locking myself in my room, like watching a lot of YouTube, uh, mm-hmm. playing a lot of video games for years until I started getting into personal development meditation, luckily. Yeah. Right. Like imagine yeah. if yeah. I took a different path. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. That isolation and then, you know, throw COVID on top of it and everybody had to take a time out for two years and, and you know, uncertainty in the world. So. Um, tell me a little bit more about your, your, your education, your training, your interest in, you know, women's issues around recovery or the, the female sp- uh, specific perspective. Uh, we were talking before the show about how that's kind of a little bit different when I was coming up through and we didn't really make a distinction. Um, and now the, the field has kind of evolved and there's a better understanding and you currently have a passion for that. So tell me a little bit more about what, what kind of drew you to that difference between men and women and what you discovered uh, as part of your, your studies and your search. Yeah, I love talking about this. So I'm actively still studying and searching. So I, part of what I do, uh, from a day job is I work at, for a consulting firm. We do some research and writing for federal agencies like SAMHSA an office of recovery. And one of the areas that I'm really interested in is stigma research. And so what I've discovered through my research on addiction stigma is that women specifically are more stigmatized than other populations than men. Um, certainly other under-resourced and marginalized groups are as well. And so you know, that led me to have another question, which is, well, why are women more stigmatized? And further you know, research has shown me that, you know, not only are there more stigmatizing attitudes towards women, but women have less access to the support that they need. For example, recovery support services that include support for children, you know, uh, meetings that have childcare, recovery housing that is trauma sensitive and trauma informed. You know, we wonder why there's this revolving door of women coming in and out of recovery homes. There is a lack of, I think, the trauma-informed and trauma-sensitive piece is very, very important. Um, but when we're talking about specifically, you know, therapy and counseling and, you know, that type of treatment for women, making sure that when we're looking at substance use disorder, that we help an individual see that as a symptom of perhaps some other underlying issues and needing to bring in other types of evidence-based support. I'm a huge proponent of seeking safety, which is an evidence-based treatment model for co-occurring substance use and trauma has been very successful for women. And I'm also a huge proponent of, we need to do more research about what's working. We need to do more to figure out, okay, why are women more stigmatized? Why is it, and not just women with addiction issues, women in recovery, 
Like I have faced stigma with employers. Despite what my resume says, I still encounter that because I identify as a woman in substance use disorder and mental health recovery. Women are being incarcerated at higher rates than men for substance use related offenses and uh, situations. Yes. And that was a new one for me to learn. Yeah. It, there's some really interesting research, um, actually, I think out of Ohio around that. And so when we look at this, you know, it just, it leads to more questions. So I, that all that being said, I wish I had more answers, but right now I think it's important that we keep asking questions and doing the research to figure out how we can help support women. So this isn't the case so that we have more housing so that we have more, trauma-informed interventions, you know? Um, yeah, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Before we go on, I want to say a few words about a new behavioral health. A new behavioral health is an outpatient provider of mental health and substance abuse services in Ohio and New Hampshire. That means that a new can successfully treat mental health and substance abuse issues or dual diagnosis if you're struggling with both. Their integrated approach allows for them to successfully address issues related to anxiety, depression, addiction, trauma, and really anything that stands between your life and the life you could be living. You really cannot bring them an issue that they have not successfully treated. They have also solved one of the biggest problems for people seeking help. They have a dedicated team waiting to hear from you at helpnow at anewbh.com. If you contact them today, within 24 hours, you will have heard back from wait for this, a real live person, and we'll also have your first appointment scheduled at that time. So how do you contact them? Well, if you're in Ohio or New Hampshire, you're probably close to one of their local locations. You're welcome to go in. If not, you can always reach them online at anewbh.com. And if you're interested in services for you or loved one, use that address, helpnow at anewbh.com. Traditionally, growing up, it was always, you know, the boys got more involved in punishment in the schools because of the way that they sort of, you know, displayed their their, their dysfunction. And uh, the courts are tougher on the guys. And you think more men, you know, and even thinking about recovery housing, having worked in that, you know, I've had to make referrals to recovery housing, uh, do a little bit of recovery housing work myself still. It's like even agencies prepare for more men than women even still. But what you're seeing is that the research is actually telling a different story, that there's actually more women. Do you have any inclination or does the research reveal why that is? Why are courts tougher on women or more likely to incarcerate or more likely to order treatment for women than men? I think, you know, I think it does boil down to that stigma piece. And, you know, whether it's intentional, I think a lot of it happens on a subconscious level. But when you're criminalizing women who have substance use disorder who are pregnant, for example, or, you know, having that piece of it involved. I mean, it, it does, it gets complicated, it gets messy. And certainly, you know, we want to make sure children are protected, but I think women, there is a greater too in some instances, not all certainly, but the stress of not only caregiving, but, you know, having to care for extended family and parents, you know, I'm in that age of, you know, needing to care, help care for parents now, you know, there's all these added responsibilities and things that I think aren't added into the equation. Um, and with housing specifically, like you said, it's not that there are fewer women that need recovery housing. There's less options available and women aren't as easily able to say, okay, I'm going to, you know, buy children. We'll see you later, you know, and I'll, I'll go and do this for a couple months. A lot of women out there today aren't as able to do that. So we need to meet women where they are with the services, you know, that they need. Uh, but yeah, it's really, really interesting. And, and again, I think it just points to the fact that we need more research and we need more folks creating those interventions for women. Yeah. And I think the children are definitely a big factor here because I've actually witnessed and seen a shift in attitudes where if you have a, a single woman with no children coming into treatment versus a woman who has children, right? And they're almost not, not, not anger, but almost like a, how could you, right? You have kids, how could you, right? And so there's like this inclination to be harder on that woman or to be more judgmental of that woman because you're not only affecting your life, you're affecting the life of, of your child as if she doesn't know that, right? As if she just now realized for the first time. I mean, they're well aware of that. But I, I, I will support that on an anecdotal basis because I've actually seen that where we've had to kind of like 
hold on, guys. Let's get back to our core programming. It's not about passing judgment. You know, everybody deserves a fair shot at recovery, that kind of thing. But there is almost like less tolerance for a woman uh, if children are involved because she, a.k.a. should know better or she shouldn't have jeopardized, you know. It's not, and, and so I think I could see how that might translate to the courts where they almost want to – I guess if you're thinking in a good way, almost want to protect the child by being harder on, on the mom. But how is that, how is that fair to that mother and her chance at getting recovery? Because when you talk about shame and guilt and, you know, the issues that come along with being an addict and now on top of that, you're receiving these punishments. Um, it's difficult. So, um, you know, we've had politicians since we're on that topic, let's talk about, it. I'd love your perspective on this, who we kind of joke, they want to arrest their way out of the problem, right? Like if you just lock everybody up, you hand out, you know, enormous sentences, you know, not in this county, not in this state, you know, we're tough on crime here and that means drugs. Um, but I've also seen the other side where people say, hey, you know, I hit bottom in that jail cell or if somebody hadn't stopped me, I would have never stopped. So what's your take or your perspective on the role of, you know, the legal system, incarceration, uh, those type of forced choices, forced consequences, maybe even um, mandated treatment? Um, you know, is there a role there or do you think that they're just sort of like way misguided in terms of how they're approaching this issue? You have some tough questions. Um, this is good. It's good because we, we need to, we, Hey, let's do it. We got it. We got an hour. Um, no, this is, this is good because we need to keep asking these questions. You know, I think, I think every system we have, including criminal justice has a place when we can, when those systems can be recovery oriented. So, you know, for example, drug court, treatment court, recovery court, those types of opportunities for people when they interact with the criminal justice system to have another option. And yeah, that might be something that they're, you know, mandated or kind of given a choice, but there's really no choice because definitely I'd rather do treatment court than, you know, go to prison. Uh, but when there are those opportunities and we can see them as that, that are recovery focused, I think that's a huge benefit for folks. And I have seen a lot of people come through recovery court and treatment court and have a lot of success because they're able to build up that really foundational 90 days, uh, you know, uh, abstinent. And they're able to build up some supports. Uh, they're able to see the benefit of not using drugs and alcohol, one of them being maybe being able to show up for their kids, right? So I think every system has a place. And I love that. I love that you're talking with policymakers. I love when policymakers too can be a part of the conversation. What does it mean to have our systems and our policy be recovery oriented and recovery focused? So I wouldn't say I'm like, you know, no, absolutely no, you know, incarceration or, you know, those types of consequences. I too have had lots of folks who have gained and started their recovery journey while, you know, experiencing incarceration. And that, that can be a benefit for some folks. Um, but I think it's important, again, to remember, you know, those places need to be recovery informed. So it's maybe not the incarceration part that was most helpful. Maybe it was connecting with a peer that they were able to talk about their issues with. Maybe it was someone was coming into the jail or you know, prison doing recovery meetings. Maybe it was a faith-based group coming in. There's a lot of great ministries happening in jail settings. So, you know, is it recovery focused and oriented? I think that's the most important question to ask when we're thinking about those other systems out there that impact people, you know, on this journey. And to be fair, I mean, I've worked in this field a long time. There are a lot of cops and sheriffs and people who run prisons who do want exactly what you're describing. They understand that this is about recovery and they want resources. It's not just about, you know, punish them until they give up and that kind of thing. I mean, that is kind of an old school idea. I mean, there are good people with, I think, the right mindset within these systems that are trying to do that. And on an outpatient level, we, you know, we work hand in hand with a lot of those agencies. You know, I've got a guy just released. He needs ongoing services. I just think there's things structurally that are preventing the best possible possible care. You know, for example, there are a lot of limitations in terms of what services can be offered to people while they're incarcerated, you know, and I understand from a safety standpoint, you don't want people coming and going all day, but you know, free market capitalism, right? If you were to open those doors and say, Hey, you know, best program wins, 
these guys would get better care. They'd have more responsive care. They'd have people who would, you know, have the right mindset and take this seriously and uh, allow them to access benefits to receive those services. Because a lot of times, uh, and I've worked with agencies that have had these contracts, you know, if you're the only game in town and you're the only people allowed to do work with them and you're just sort of maintaining your contract, well, human nature says that's going to, you know, lead to a little bit of a reduction in terms of quality of care. You want to open that up and say, hey, you know, do your best job, and if we think that there's a better option available, then we're going to take advantage of that. And I think that helps everybody be on top of their game because, you know, the prisons and, you know, their primary purpose is incarceration. But this idea that, um, you know, that we're spitting out fully rehabilitated, stable folks who are perfectly equipped and well-equipped to move to that next step and transition is just – the recidivism rates tell us that that's not exactly the case right now. You know, there's still a, an issue there. I think that point where there is that reentry into the community is such an important one, like you said. And, you know, we're seeing, too, that the rates of overdose fatality have increased after that period of time when folks are leaving, uh, being incarcerated. And so I think another really important thing that we need to be asking ourselves and working with law enforcement and working with community based providers and folks is how can we increase the support for people re-entering into the community. That that period of time, we need to make sure that there are supports in place for those folks. Or like you said, unfortunately, the recidivism rate is very, very high. So in real terms, Caroline, what, you know, if we gave you the the, the policy magic wand and you had control of those re-entry programs, what would it look like? What do you think are the necessary resources? Oh, I like that yeah. question. Thank you for um, Go giving nuts. me Go all nuts. of the funding <laughs> and resources to create supports. I love that. Yep. Um, I love creating programs, so I'm going to run with this one. But no, I think having very firm programs in place, not just inside, you know, while folks are in the system. And like you said, having quality support, connecting them with the quality providers in the community, having, you know, groups and treatment groups, I think, within the system would be extremely helpful and to transition out and ensure that there's kind of this continuity of care between what's happening and the relationships that are being formed and then out. And because I think a lot of times we forget that trust and relationships, that relational piece is one of the most important things for folks to get better and to feel that they can have hope for their lives. So how can we build that into a program? And I think that continuity of, of care would be a, a very important piece. And then I think the other one is how, you know, leveraging other community assets. So like treatment providers, uh, counselors, clinics, and also faith-based communities, you know, other types of services, housing, everything someone needs to have a successful life, childcare, you know, bringing all of those pieces together and looking at recovery support more holistically. So yes, if I had kind of a blank check to create a program, it would involve all of those pieces to help help someone. And you mentioned a couple of times you like the recovery housing aspect. Um, you think that's a key part of the plan. What, uh, what do you like about recovery housing and why do you think it's so effective? I think it really comes down to the relational piece having people in a position where they're, I don't want to say uh, forced intimacy because that doesn't feel very trauma informed, but uh, really in a place of needing to connect, needing to be relational, rely on someone else. I remember in my early active addiction, I, I didn't feel like I could trust anyone or anyone would help me. I felt like I had to do it all by myself. You know, so you're in this position where it's like you have this family, really. You know, the most successful houses, recovery houses I've seen, people describe as a family. It feels like home. It feels like a family. So you have these relationships, you know, where you get to learn how to do things like basically, you know, adult, right? Go grocery shopping, cook food, you know, do those things, you know, hang out with your kids, have conversations, listen. You have a place that's safe and that's dignified that feels like home and you have a family. And I think that when you have those pieces, when you feel like you're a part of a family and you belong somewhere, that is a beautiful environment where you can thrive. When you come out of treatment or incarceration into this environment where you got sick or into an unhealthy situation, maybe a toxic environment that you know claims to be a recovery house, those things aren't going to happen. I think the housing piece is just, it's a key, key component to, to healing and to health. Yeah. And it gives you that longer runway, right? So 
versus the 30 day program or someplace like, you know, you're being released and you got to have an outpatient counselor in place by Monday. And then, you know, we, whenever somebody leaves a residential program, we kind of call it the bubble, right? They're leaving the bubble because in the program, everything is kind of managed for you, right? Like lunch is at this time, dinner is at this time, group is at this time. And then um, sadly, I think one of the big mistakes is, is, is missing that middle step where you go from that residential program where everything's kind of managed for you and you can talk about what's coming, but you have to live it, you know, and then you step down is what they call it to, okay, you get counseling one hour a week, you know, stay with your therapist, you know, maybe if you're lucky, you get a group, you know, that kind of thing, get an outpatient program, you go to group twice a week or something like that. Uh, you know, there's that middle piece there. And just like, just like a regular set of stairs, if you're walking down the stairs and you miss a step, you know, you're going to lose your balance. And I think the same thing happens for a lot of people in early recovery and it becomes overwhelming, right? And it reminds you of those out of control days and those out of control moments. And then those thoughts creep in of, I can't do this. You know, I can't, I'm, you know, it's too much. It's moving too fast. And, um, and unfortunately that's where we see, you know, the relapse. So, um, you know, with, with you, the other thing I think it's important to talk about too is I, we don't have to get into your intimate details, but you certainly have some clean time, you know, stacked up, right? But there's also this dichotomy between like, can you ever really fully recover? Recover, you know, are you free of the problem or is it an ongoing challenge? So, do you mind to share a little bit about you know what your recovery maintenance looks like now and maybe how that evolved over time? Like, are you doing things to support your recovery that look a lot like when you were in early recovery, or has it changed over time? Interestingly, I think it, it has changed a little bit over time, but some of those core things like having people I trust and those healthy relationships, being connected to a recovery community, you know, when things get hard for me, I reach out to a therapist today. You know, I have those people in my life that back when I was first getting sober, um, having that community was so important. So that part of it hasn't changed for me. You know, I still need that community. And I think today, you know, I love to say, oh, I have it all together and everything's always wonderful. Well, that's just not life, right? I'm in recovery. I believe it's a process. You know, it's not a destination. Recovery is a process. And so today when I struggle, I have the tools that I can lean back on and say, you know what? I need to reach out to my support system a little bit more, or I need to set up a counseling appointment, or, you know, I need to do this, that, or the other thing to uh, help me stay healthy, you know, and some of the things that I've found also help my recovery. I didn't know at the time were part of my, you know, recovery pathway, but exercise, I mean, and, you know, being in my forties now, it looks a little different than it did 15 years ago, but Hey, moving my body, whether it's just walking down the road, you know, with my dog or my kids or doing yard work or, you know, being outside, uh, eating healthy, you know, watching, my sugar, which I'm not always great at, but you know, when I can do other things that help my reading, I love reading. Um, when I can do other things for my wellness, you know, recovery to me today is a lot more holistic than it used to be. You know, I used to think it was just treatment or it was just going to a meeting, but today it's other things that I do to take care of myself. That's a part of my journey, but yeah, I love recovery community and what I do today for, you know, a living keeps me connected to helping others and being of service. And that's a part of my recovery too. And I love the progression of that too, because I do think people, I've heard that in early recovery, they sort of say like, well, if this is it, you know, I'm bored out of my mind. You're in the anhedonia state, like your dopamine's low and you're just, you're just not feeling it, right? Like early recovery can kind of feel like, you know, life with the volume turned down or it can feel like, you know, shades of gray. There's not a lot of color, you know, you're, you're going through the motions and you're doing what people say you're supposed to do, but you're not always feeling it. And I think a key part of your story and a lot of people who get into long-term recovery is that this, this is not how you experience it forever. Your body heals, your mind heals, your spirit heals. And those colors come back and the richness and fullness of life is available to you. It's not just grinding out two meetings a day for the rest of your life and serving time. Um, yes, there are, there is some blocking and tackling you have to do early on to keep yourself safe. Uh, but there, you know, there's bigger and better things. There's better experiences. There's more to it as you grow into it. So I think it's important to, to hang in there and not leave before the miracle happens, as they say. I love that same. That is so true. And I kind of giggled there because it, it is so true. I mean, you do feel like this is the only, you know, is this what it is to be in recovery? It's like, this is excruciating, you know? Uh, but today, I mean, I would not, you can pay me to go back to a life in active addiction. I just, I feel so free. You know, I know what joy is. 
I mean, I have all these gifts and blessings of recovery of family, you know, a great job. I get to talk to people like you, you know, I mean, recovery can be such an amazing, beautiful thing that yes, not giving up before the miracle happens. You got to do it. You got to hang on because it gets better. It's so funny. Some of the, some of the early stories, like going to sober parties when you first get clean, right? It's like the weirdest thing in the world. And like, they're all so weird and they're drinking diet Coke and just, you know, coffee like crazy. And like, what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to just like watch TV and play board games? It's like, nah, you'll, you'll figure it out. There's a lot of fun stuff out there. Um, one thing I want to touch on, cause we have a little bit of time left. I don't want to leave without exploring this topic a little bit more is that concept of trust. So you talked a lot about, you know, learning to trust again and, and the value of a trusting relationship, right? So once again, one of my famous kind of two-part questions, as somebody who was hurt and had a lot of evidence that people can be dangerous and maybe you shouldn't trust everybody, how did you learn to trust again? You know, how did you open yourself up to that and even create a possibility for trust to grow? And then the second part of that question is, is what can helpers, loved ones, people who want to be of assistance, what can they do to help build that bridge on their side and make trust possible as well. Yeah. So for me, trust, you know, I mentioned spending some time in an outpatient treatment group and I would go twice a week, you know, for one hour each time, so two hours a week for a couple months. And for me, it was consistently showing up, being uncomfortable. I mean, I was, I mean, talk about sober events. I mean, I was just terrified. You know, I didn't know how to be a person. I didn't know how to communicate. I didn't know how to have a conversation or listen. But the more that I showed up uncomfortable, trusting that, you know, people told me this would work. I had to just go out on a limb and have faith that it would. The more that I showed up, I started to not only see other people as trusting because they showed me that they were other people in recovery. You know, they would answer their phone when I called, when I was upset, they would, you know, I, I didn't have any money. They'd throw down five bucks so I could get a cup of coffee. They would show up consistently. Over time, they showed me that people can be trustworthy. And I importantly came to a place where I started to trust myself because I think that's where my trust issues, really the root of that was that I had been through so much, but also made so many negative choices and, you know, been through so much trauma that my trust of myself was, so, you know, non-existent. So when I could show up consistently and show up for myself by being sober, that's really, I think, when I was able to trust others in a new way. And so, you know, I always point back to that group of, you know, young people in recovery. It was foundational for me. So folks, family members, therapists, and other people trying to help those of us, you know, like me, like I was on that, you know, early on in my journey, I think consistency showing up and showing that people can be trustworthy. You know, don't telling people that, pe you know, you can't say it. You need to show it, show people that you can be trustworthy. And I think, you know, I mentioned before that people believed in me. So I had people telling me that I was trustworthy, that I was, you know, a leader, that I was helpful in the group. People were speaking that life and hope into my life, you know, whether they, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming they saw that, right. Uh, they saw something in me, but when you see something in someone else, speak it, name it, you know, be positive, be encouraging. I think that can really do wonders, especially if you're like me and you didn't hear that enough growing up, you know, and you certainly didn't hear that in active addiction. So the more that we can show up for other people and show that we can be trustworthy um, and speak that and encourage that, I think can be really, really helpful. Yeah. And understanding that somebody in early, re in early recovery is not always going to thank you for your efforts, right? Like there's that <laughs> phrase that th those who need your love the most sometimes will act like they deserve it the least, right? And often we apply that to kids when they're throwing a fit, they actually need your attention, they need your love, but they're acting like, you know, that's like the last thing you want to do is love them. And I think for somebody in early recovery, understanding that you're probably, if you choose to support somebody in early recovery, they're probably going to not really appreciate your efforts to begin with. You know, they may actually actively fight you on those efforts. You know, leave me alone. I want that isolation, you know, and, you know, why do you even bother? And they'll challenge it. But understanding that that comes from a place of hurt, a place of self-doubt, and it's not a reflection of, you know, your efforts or the fact that there might not be future appreciation for those efforts. So uh, it's, not a, it's not a paved road. It's not a straight line to recovery. And there's going to be some bumps 
and there's going to be some mean words and there's going to be some uh, emotional things, you know, that they're going through. Uh, but that behavior is a form of communication and to the best of your ability, don't give up, right. And don't give up on that person. Uh, because like we were saying this entire time, you know, better days are possible. Um, Ian, you had some thoughts. Yeah. Um, I noticed that you said one of the major things that helped your recovery, um, is learning to trust yourself. And then you mentioned that because you had experienced trauma, it was a difficult thing for you to do. Now, what I'm curious about, um, is if someone goes through a traumatic event, um, oftentimes it's something external that happens to them, a person, an event. Uh, I'm just very curious to know why would a traumatized person uh, not trust themselves after something mm. happens to them that's external. Caroline, you or me? You want to go first, or you know, I'm being I'll be, I'll be chivalrous. The ladies first. <laughs> More tough questions. No, that's good. I mean, it's a good question, you know. And I think, I think there's a lot that can happen through you know the trauma and then the healing process. But one of those being that you know when we experience those really tough things and those adverse childhood experiences, we're not always able to at that place in our, you know, development to understand that this hasn't, you know, this isn't our fault, <laughs> uh, that we have a lot of shame wrapped around uh, some of those things. And so I think that trusting piece was, you know, trusting, like, can I trust that this situation wasn't my fault? You know, can I trust that? I mean, talk about trust issues. If you have adults in your life that are the ones who are perpetrators, I mean, how can you move forward with either trusting adults or trusting your own feelings or trusting safety? So I think there's so many things wrapped or wrapped up in that idea that, you know, when we experience trauma, we lose trust, not only in the people who may have caused that trauma, but we lose trust in ourselves. You know, there's a phrase in recovery that, you know, says that our best thinking got us here, right? And they talk about kind of like when you were making all the decisions, you know, you ended up in jail or you ended up addicted or you ended up in these groups or you ended up homeless or whatever that kind of thing. Right. And so even as a child, there's like, you know, to kind of back up what Caroline's saying, there's this natural tendency to turn inward after those experiences and think about your role. Well, did I provoke him? Uh, did I, you know, it, it's the classic kind of disgusting, but it used to be the whole, well, what were you wearing kind of attitude towards sexual assault, right? Like, did you, were you putting it out there that maybe you wanted this, right? And so when you get those messages externally, you, and you connect that to that, that idea. When I was making all the decisions, I ended up really hurt. Maybe I'm not so good at making decisions. Maybe I made the wrong decisions. Maybe I bleeped up along the way. And even though from a logical external standpoint, we can look at it and go, no, of course you didn't do anything to make your father do that. Of course you did. You know, from an emotional standpoint, it's really hard to understand that, especially when those experiences get hardwired in at eight years old or six years old or 11 years old, right? Because now it's wired in there at a child's level of understanding. And now you go forward as a chronological adult. And that's what the processing is all about is going back to that place and recalibrating and reevaluating and getting an adult understanding of something that got wired in when you were a child. Uh, Cause you just classified it in the wrong place. You may have classified it as my fault or you may have classified it as my mistake or you classified it as I did something wrong. And when you put that initial classification in place, it can take a lifetime to put a new one in there that takes its place, a more logical one. Right. Yeah. But Logic and emotion don't always speak the same language, you know? And so just because you can understand it from a logical standpoint does not mean it undoes that damage emotionally because that's how it was originally coded. Um, so and I don't know if that helps. You recreate that belief. You recreate that world system through your relationship, through other areas in your life, maybe even your career. It's just Yeah, you, you gain evidence to the contrary, right? You gain other experiences that tell you it can be different. And like Caroline's talking about, she was advocating for therapy. That's the real work of therapy is getting to a trusting place where you can be in a room with a stranger who's not a stranger at that point because you've built your trust and go, okay, I'm going to go back to that room when I was eight years old and I'm going to take an, a, another look at what happened here and see how I feel about it now, um, which is so scary for somebody who has survived that and takes a lot of work. But that's that reprogramming. That's that reprocessing. That's the heavy work of therapy that can totally change somebody's life and free them. I mean, Caroline, your word was freedom. I feel so free, you know? 
it's a beautiful thing really when we can come to this place of freedom. And when you were sharing, it just made me think about the fact that, you know, recovery is a process of healing and it's also a process of unlearning. We're unlearning some of those really unhealthy coping strategies, unhealthy ways of thinking, things that may have been hardwired in our brain from some early traumatic experiences. So we're unlearning some of that, but yes, seeing a therapist, having support, recovery services, those things that can help us unlearn some of those old behaviors and old ways of thinking can be so freeing. And, and terrifying. I mean, it's just uh, acknowledging how difficult a process that is. Again, we're not going nitty gritty, but, you know, with dual diagnosis, with complex trauma, I mean, just even on a personal level, I can imagine there were some there were some tough days on the couch, so to speak, you know, and then you have to carry that around for until your next session. And it's hard work. It's really hard. It is, it is really challenging. And I think, you know, I want to make sure that folks have hope in that, that the challenge is worth it. And what's wonderful as you go through recovery, when you have a supportive community around you and supportive folks is you don't have to do it alone. You don't have to, I never had to do, yeah, I did the the trauma therapy, you know, with my therapist and that was an individual thing. But after that, I got to walk out what that healing was and maybe some of the struggles I was experiencing in a community of people and not isolated. And that's really where I was able to learn more about, you know, the healing process through that. So while it's challenging, there's definitely, you know, don't give up. I guess we keep kind of returning to that, that it is so worth it. And, you know, the place of freedom is just, oh, I just, I want everyone to reach that um, because it's a wonderful place to be in. So we're, we're getting close on time, but we're talking a lot about not giving up. I want to touch base with you on one topic really quick before we transition out. And that is this idea of like starting and how to get started, right? So if you could go back in time and talk to that younger version of yourself, or if somebody's listening to this show, very likely, by the way, statistically, that is dealing with this issue, um, what, what, you know, what would be your advice or what would be your guidance today about how to get started on, you know, in recovery or dealing with these issues or addressing this, how would you sort of counsel somebody to just like, okay, if you feel like this is an issue for you, this is what I would instruct you to do to get this process going. Well, definitely if it was a young person, I would encourage them to go to that person that you trust. Maybe it's not your parent, you know, maybe it's not your teacher. Maybe it's a friend's parent or whoever that person that you trust the most is and let them know what's going on. Like let them into what you're experiencing because, you know, I would tell my past self, you can talk about what happened. I think so many of us get stuck in that place of shame and isolation and we're the only ones, you know, to experience this. And that's frankly not true. You know, sadly, so many folks are dealing with it in terms of, you know, that sexual violence and assault piece. I think recent uh, Center for Disease Control stats came out that said one in four high school girls have experienced sexual violence today. I mean, that's like, you know, today's statistics. So whatever the trauma is that you're experiencing, reaching out to that trusted person. And for folks who may be on the outside and seeing someone who's struggling, I think one of the most helpful things we can do is have the mindset of not what's wrong with you or why are you doing this, but what happened. You know, I wish someone would have asked me, what happened to you? What happened? And to open up that place where someone can have a conversation about likely, you know, again, looking at the research, likely something happened. So being able to talk about that and address that early on is is really important. Do you... um and this is also anecdotal, but you seem to be into the research, that connection between trauma and addiction, is that is that almost universal at this point? I mean, have we seen, I mean, I know the numbers are really, really you know, strong in terms of correlation, but whether it be a mental health issue, dual diagnosis with an addiction or a trauma experience, you know, dual diagnosis, you know, with addiction, are you seeing that mostly going hand in hand pretty much across the board? Like, have you had anybody... Or can you think of anybody that, you know, has been sort of just just lost control of their addiction, you know, didn't really have any early trauma, doesn't have any co-occurring? Are you seeing that pretty much a one-for-one correlation there? I mean, you know, that's a great question. Anecdotally, I would say it pretty much mirrors what the research says, which is around 90% of folks, um, you know, maybe one or two people over the past 15 years 
that have had a substance use disorder without any, you know, um, that they were aware of anyways. Um, so, you know, I, I think I, I would, you know, I, I feel pretty confident in saying across the board, we have all experienced something. I mean, even today, you know, maybe you didn't experience childhood trauma, but you lived through 2020 and that was pretty traumatic for a lot of us, right? Um, there's things happening in our world today that, you know, most of us have experienced some type of trauma and are dealing with those symptoms. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty startling, but I think at the same time, you know, helpful to understand when we're thinking about how we can support other folks. And I say that in an attempt to normalize because I think what, what again, what you're kind of talking about is anything that isolates us or divides us kind of keeps us sick, you know, if you will, keeps us in that addiction. And so, you know, if you're somebody who's like, well, yeah, okay, I've, I've got this drug issue, but I'm also hearing voices or I also have panic attacks every day or gosh, A, B, and C happened to me and I've been through so much and they're just not going to understand me. They're not going to get it. They're, you know, I'm, I'm one of one and, um, you know, I, my problems are too big and too complex and there's too many layers. I just, I, I just think I want people to understand like that's the majority of the people in those rooms. You know what I mean? You're going to fit right in. Like, don't use that as a reason to not come because, uh, that's everybody. That's everybody's story, sadly. And I don't mean to say it in any kind of humorous way. It's really, really sad, but this didn't exist in a vacuum. This just didn't pop up out of nowhere. There was an unmet need. There was an adverse experience or something that you're treating through this behavior. And that's a weird thing I think for people to understand about addiction is that it's not your problem. It's how you're treating your problem and it's just not working. Right. You know? And so we need to get you some better coping skills. You nailed it early on in the conversation when you identified it as a coping skill. It absolutely is a, is a coping skill. Uh, and one that works really, really well for a period of time. Uh, but unfortunately it comes with a dark side that brings, you know, more problems and solutions. So Caroline, this is great. Listen, I, I, you know, I, what do you what do you think? We could probably go four or five hours and just like, barely be scratching the surface. I mean, it's, there's so much here, but um, I appreciate making the time. How do people connect with you? Do you want to be do you want to be found? Are you on, on social? Like, how do people learn more about you and learn more about your work and connect with you? Oh, I, lo I love to connect. One of my favorite things to do. So yes, absolutely. I think my favorite place to connect these days is through my Substack uh, newsletter. So that is Circle of Chairs, Circle of Chairs that may kind of bring your mind to a recovery meeting or space. And I really love to talk about some of the things we shared today and just be really vulnerable about the recovery journey. So Circle of Chairs on Substack. And of course, you can find me on my website, carolinebeidler.com. I've got a couple books, a couple more coming. So I would love to, you know, just stay in contact with folks and uh, love hearing from people in the community. And we'll, we'll link all that below, but tell us, I mean, I don't, we don't need a full, full bio, but tell us, that you, you know, can we have the titles of your books or how do we, how do we find those? Sure. Yeah. So carolinebeidler.com, my email address, uh, my first book is called Downstairs Church, Finding Hope in the Grit of Trauma uh, and Addiction Recovery. And so I talk about what happens in the you know, quote unquote, downstairs spaces, the, the secretive places, you know, of recovery meetings and communities and bringing that into the light. So all folks can understand, you know, what happens in this process. Um, I have another book coming in the fall to be titled yet. And then another one this spring on anxiety and connecting that to recovery. So I'm really excited about that. So, you know, if you follow me on Substack, you'll get all the news on Circle of Chairs of when things are coming out. And um, I love giving my book away for free too. So if you all want to oh. drop a link, <laughs> I know I just, you know, I yeah, love yeah. for, um, Good for you. yeah, it to be accessible. So I have a link for a free digital download of Downstairs Church. So I'd love to share that with listeners too. Absolutely. We'll connect all that. Caroline, thank you so much. I mean, I, I'm sitting here, my head is spinning. So, you know, in recovery yourself, you're maintaining that, um, you know, the, the, you've got the boys, you've got your practice, you've got these books, you've got your advocacy, um, you know, occasional sleeper, I guess you just have more, <laughs> more energy than hours in the day, I suppose. So uh, bless you for all that you're doing. And, and all jokes aside, I mean, 
you know, taking what happened to you and taking your experiences and using that to help others uh, with your passion and your authenticity. There, there's no doubt uh, you're saving lives out there. There's no doubt that clients are connecting with you. And so our field is tough because we, we don't always get thank you cards, right? Like when they're healthy, they kind of disappear and they go do their thing, you know, and, and you hope for the best. But, uh, you know, from one helper to another, there's, there's no doubt that you're saving people. So uh, bless you and thank you for all you're doing and, and, and keep it up. I mean, it sounds like you're doing a great job. So thank you for all you do. Thanks so much. You too. You too. You are doing the same. I appreciate it. And Ian, thank you again. Another smooth journey. Very good questions. Uh, love Ian's perspective. Get the, the young, the youngsters perspective on this stuff that a bunch of, uh, you know, sort of young people are talking about. We're not, we're not done yet, but, um, so I appreciate you Ian and all you do to make this possible. And for you watching or listening, I appreciate you. Uh, I say it every episode, time is your most valuable asset and you chose to spend, uh, an hour and nine minutes with us or whatever survives editing. So, uh, I thank you so much for that. And if you've made it this far, you must've gotten something out of that. If you want to learn more, please click, click the links below. Um, obviously, you can follow us on all socials, uh, like and follow, subscribe, all that good stuff so you don't miss content like this. Uh, and just thank you for your time. Uh, and in, like I always say, to close it up, until next time, I hope you take care of yourself. And I really hope uh, you put some effort into taking care of each other as well. So thank you so much. Hey, guys, although Through Help and Back is an excellent podcast with a lot of great ideas, I do want to let you know that in no way is Through Help and Back expected to be perceived as or relied upon in any way as specific medical advice or mental health advice for you personally. The information provided through Through Help and Back on our website or our podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment that can be provided by your own providers. Do not use our content in lieu of professional advice given by qualified medical professionals and do not disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking professional advice because of the information you have read on our website, heard on our podcast, or otherwise received from us. Although we love discussing issues related to health care, mental health, and addiction, we are not providing direct health care, mental health care, medical, or nutrition therapy services. We're not attempting to diagnose, treat, prevent, or cure in any manner whatsoever any physical or psychological ailment, any mental or emotional issue, disease, or condition. We are not giving you specific medical, psychological, or religious advice whatsoever. Please take care of yourself and take care of others as you always seek the advice of your own medical providers and your own mental health providers regarding any questions or concerns you have about your specific health or before implementing any recommendations or suggestions from us. These are ideas that have worked for other people. We think it's important to share them. We do not guarantee that they will work for you specifically. Do not stop taking any medications without speaking to your physician nurse practitioner, physician assistant, mental health provider, or any other healthcare or medical professional. And if you have or suspect that you have a medical or mental health issue, contact your own healthcare provider promptly. Also, one last thing, if you know or suspect that you are currently experiencing a crisis, it is absolutely imperative that you seek the advice of your doctor or other emergency healthcare services prior to ever thinking about using our content. We love the conversations. We're glad you're stopping by. We hope you take a lot from the content. But again, for your specific individual medical situation, please always seek quality personal care from your own providers. Do not let this uh, information or this advice stand on its own. Thanks so much for listening.